Good morning, everybody. You know, we know that Pontius Pilate freed a thief named Barabbas in place of Jesus. We know about that story, don't we? We also know that while he was on the cross, Jesus forgave another thief, the proverbial thief on the cross that tells us you can be saved right at the very end. You don't even have to get baptized to be saved. You just have to trust Jesus with your heart. Amen? But what about that third thief? I want to talk to you this morning about the unrepentant thief. If you will, open with me in your Bibles to the 23rd chapter of the book of Luke. Luke chapter 23, and we're going to look at verse 39 as our text. Luke chapter 23 and verse 39. And will you stand in honor of God's word? If you are able to do so, do that. <laughs> Again, Luke 23, 39. Luke 23, 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Father, I pray this morning that your name would be honored and glorified, that your truth would come through, that you'd work in hearts. If someone's here this morning and they've never come to Christ, you'd convict them. All of us, Lord God, would be moved by your word probably move me out of the way and all the distractions all of us brought with us that the devil might try to use. Focus us on your word. We ask it humbly, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Basically, you have in the picture here, in the broader context, you have three men hanging on crosses. One is atoning. Jesus Christ is atoning for the sins of the world. One is being atoned. The thief on the cross that does get saved, saved by grace and absolutely nothing else, and one for whom there would be no atonement. Not that there couldn't have been, but the other thief on the cross, who's a wretched soul indicative of all the lostness in the world, a tragic reminder of the futility of life outside a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you might think, well, what do we know about him? We don't know very much. Well, actually, if we examine the text carefully and examine the Word of God broadly, we know more about this man than you may think. First of all, we know that he was a criminal. The Bible says here that he was a criminal in the original language of the New Testament. He's a kathurgos, an evildoer. Matthew 27, 44, telling the same story as the detail that he and his partner on the cross that did receive Christ as Savior, were lestai, which means they were robbers or revolutionaries. They were probably, like Barabbas, people who had tried to start an insurrection. They may have just been common thieves, and they would have been at the very most, though, armed robbers because the language indicates weaponry. They, they were violent criminals. So either they're revolutionaries or they are strong-armed Armed robbers, they had a sword or a bow or some kind of weapon. He is an absolute criminal. There are people out there who are violent criminals. And we see these violent criminals that are hardened thugs. But remember, his partner gets saved. There's always hope. But he is a hardened, violent 
thug. But outside Christ, everybody is a thug. Now that's not nice to say, Brother Bill. How about all those sweet people that just won't get saved? But the, No, the Bible says, while you may not be a violent criminal, not every lost person does every nasty thing, we are sinners outside of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.23 says, For all is sin and come short of the glory of God. I'm going to dig into some theology early on this morning. Brothers and sisters, while this is a somewhat... Uh, contentious issue, not very bad. I believe that for this reason, you and I need to remain firmly, here's some the theological language, but we need to be single predestinarians, which means that it is not God that made this man a thug. God didn't change his heart. God didn't harden him. He chose to be a criminal thug. Now, it's God's credit when we get saved. It's God's work in our life that our hearts change and He gets all the glory. But we need to face the fact that there is a criminal element in all of human hearts as we rebel against God. There is something about us that wants to shake our fist at law and order. There's something about the human spirit that wants to say, I will not be told what to do, and I will take what I want by power, even happens in some people's lives. I will take the bull by the horns, and I will get me a pistol, and in a pistol there's power, or in a sword there's power, in violence there's power. And again, without making any kind of a, a statement, folks, you can, I believe, take away all the guns in the world, but you can't change a human heart. You, you, you could outlaw weapons. You could outlaw swords. You could make people go down to water guns. And if you could still do it, there would be people trying to put ammonia acid in their water gun to spark somebody else in the eye. Because the human heart sometimes has this criminal element. And I'm going to go one step further this morning. You chew on it, take what you can take, and spit out the rest. But I want to say to you that the truth is we sometimes, in our brokenness, admire the criminal thugs of the world. In the 1930s, Bonnie and Clyde were horrible, low-life criminals. That's all they were. They were killers, and they took what they wanted. They were bad people, but they became heroes to some people during the Great Depression. Almost sympathize with them. We look at Billy the Kid back in the Old West. Folks, Billy the Kid was a homicidal maniac. But we admire, there's something about that that we change around and we rethink because there's something in the human heart in our lostness before Jesus changes our heart that says, secretly I admire the person that just takes what they want and does what they want and runs over who they got to do. Why, it's the survival of the fittest, evolutionary thinking. Folks, that's who this guy was. He was someone almost surely that other people admired. He was someone almost surely that other people, other perhaps young men admired. His mentality was that of Al-Qaeda or ISIS or the young school shooter that just says, I've been bullied, I've been pushed around, I will go get my revenge, I'll take what I want, and instead of working, I'll just take this down to the liquor store and get the money I need. He was a criminal. And I want to say to you, Lost people, everybody's a criminal. Whether they're a violent criminal or not, everybody wants to do it to someone else when you're lost. And the older you get sometimes, the less sense it makes to you, to just, the more sense it makes to you to just lose all your naive innocence and take what you want. Bitterness happens in the hearts and minds of people, and that's who this fellow was. We also know that he was condemned. He was literally evil and nailed for it. Jesus was nailed to the cross, sinless, but this man was nailed for it. In fact, if you read the next verse, what his friend, the other guy on the cross, says to him is, we are here because we ought to be. We are justly convicted. He was hung in the original language. I won't shoot the big long Greek word at you, but it's an aorist passive participle, which means he had been hung. He didn't want to be on the cross. He didn't want to be 
punished. He was in fact put there by the Roman government by all indications unlike Jesus because he ought to have been condemned for his sin, for his crime. There are people in prison. There are people in the death chamber. And we pray, God, they come to Jesus as the other thief on the cross did and know heaven and glorify God. But law and order in this world demands some law and order, doesn't it? You know? Law and order, you to have an ordered world, some people got to hang on crosses and some people got to go to the penitentiary. And depending on your view, I won't go into all that this morning. I got a whole message on that. Maybe some people have to die for capital murder. And he was condemned for his wickedness. Not all condemned people are guilty. There may be a few people that sneak through and they didn't commit the crime and they get punished anyway. But folks, our system of justice errs on the side of the accused powerfully. This isn't in my message and we can talk about it another time. But the chances of someone winding up getting the death penalty that's not guilty. It does happen. I don't deny that. But it is in infinitesimally low percentage in our culture. There are a few that are highlighted, brought out, and they make a 2020 news story. But almost nobody gets through the whole appeals process and goes to the death chamber in our culture that isn't dead to rights guilty of what they did. That's just the truth. That's the way our system is. This fellow also... Even though the Roman system didn't have near that level of due process, this fellow was guilty of what he did. His other buddy outed him, and he was looking for a way out, maybe. He may have been bitter, and he's clearly angry, but he is guilty, justifiably condemned, and outside of Christ, everybody is. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Here's what some folk think. The devil puts in people's hearts a misplaced sympathy. The devil places in people's hearts a sympathy to lost people. And he tries to whisper in the ears of some, well, this person is going to go to hell. But that's sad. It almost makes God out to be the villain. God is going to put this person in hell. Well, they seem to be a nice person. They seem to be nice to me. They keep the yard clean, and I think they're nice. But the Bible says that when people go to hell, they go to hell, they're condemned because they're sinners. And in this case, this man is headed not just for temporal death in this world, which he deserved, but he is also headed for eternal separation from God in hell because he's a sinner and that has nothing to do necessarily with the particular crime that he was being executed that day for. He would have gone to hell anyway because, folks, here's the thing we need to hear and it's said that it's not said in our Baptist pulpits enough but a lot of us are still saying it. I don't know if that's a fair appellation or not. But lost people go to hell because they're condemned because they deserve to go to hell. Every lost person you know that doesn't come to Jesus, no matter how nice you think they are, how you think God might give them clemency because they seem sweet to you, by the standards of a holy God, they are going to hell because they should go to hell. And if you don't tell them about Jesus and they come to Christ, they will go to hell. And we sense somehow in our hearts the need for justice in this world. And we know, man, the criminal's got to be punished. And, and sometimes the person has to be executed. And Sometimes it has to happen for there to be a, a, a world in which there's law and order and things make sense, but somehow we think that heaven will be populated with people that thumbed their nose at God and got there anyway. I'm telling you, no, no, no. This man rejected Jesus, and he got what he deserved. We also know that he questioned Christ's identity. He may have had his own death hastened a little bit. John 19 says that his legs were broken. Jesus' weren't because the Bible said that they wouldn't be. But he questioned Christ's identity before he died. Now, we think he's probably clearly a Jewish person. The Romans didn't, they did execute other Romans for crimes, but they didn't crucify them. 
So you had to be a non-Roman to be crucified, given the fact that it's at Jerusalem. He's almost surely a Jewish person. And so he well may have had some religion. He may have well had expectations about what the Messiah ought to be, this military guy that he may well himself have thought himself to be, much like Barabbas and the other thief that does get saved, but he does not and will not have a personal relationship with Christ. Faith in Christ may well have had the common misunderstanding of his times, and that may be where some of this bitterness comes from, some of this almost, almost venom coming into his life. One of the malefactors railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. You can hear the bitterness. Well, if you're the Jesus, if you're the Messiah, given my expectations of what a Messiah ought to be, the one that's going to beat up the Romans, why is it we're still here on this cross? Jesus, why didn't you do something about this? If you're the Messiah, oh boy. Not a good time to be bad-mouthing God in human flesh, but he doesn't know who the Lord is, and he's got this anger, even though in a minute he gets to hear his friend, who himself at first professed anger and rebellion, get saved. But he rebels because he has a weird understanding of who Jesus is. Even today... To many people, Jesus is something other than what the Bible says. Just a great teacher, a moralist, great example. But he has to be your personal Lord and Savior for you to make heaven. There may be members of churches that find the phrase personal relationship with Christ confusing. In John 3, 7, Jesus said you must be born again. We'll talk about that more later. But I just wonder if there are people who have even made it in church, maybe you're even here on this Sunday morning, and you've gone for decades in church, but when you hear people talk about being born again, coming to Christ, being converted to Christ, it seems like a strange statement to you. And you say, well, you know, uh, ever since I was a little kid, I was taught the things of God, and I believed all these things, and I memorized all my verses, and I went, I got dipped, I did the whole thing. But this getting saved, it just doesn't, it doesn't resonate with me. Well, it better, because you won't make heaven if it doesn't. This man needed a conversion in his life. My own testimony that I've shared uh, in various ways, I was very angry before I got saved. And I'm not going to say that I never get mad, get angry, get upset, because she could just stand up and call me a liar right here in church probably. <laughs> oh, we all do. But I mean as far as just being a violently angry, bitter person, Jesus took that away. And he'll take it away for anybody. But the truth is, this person had these weird expectations of Christ. Your expectations of Jesus better line up with what the New Testament says about Jesus. Because he calls the shots. We also know that he did not respect the Lord. The Bible says here that he was railing. Literally the word blaspheme. Bad mouthing Jesus. He continued to do it in imperfect active verb in the Greek. He, he was kept on bad mouthing Jesus. He wouldn't shut up. He wouldn't shut up. Bad mouthing Jesus. There are hostile people angry toward God and Jesus Christ. And you run into them all the time. There are apathetic people that don't talk about the Lord at all, but you hear people. They'd be talking about how God allowed bad things to happen in their life. And when they were young, something bad happened. Something recently bad happened. Look at all the bad things that happened in the world. And they're always just constantly shaking their fist in God and they won't shut up. And they're railing against Almighty God, not respecting the Lord. Let me read you a couple of quotes here. First of all, from... St. Augustine, his epic work, The City of God, translated into to English. But the proud scorned to take God for their master because the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, so that with these miserable creatures it is not enough that they are sick, but they boast of their sickness and are ashamed of the medicine which would heal them, and doing so they secure not elevation but a more disastrous Fall. J.P. McBeth, a Baptist writer several years ago, said, Each rejection of Christ 
hardens the unbeliever a little more. No lost person has a tender heart. They have hard hearts that are rapidly growing more callous. No person can turn from Jesus without doing serious detriment to his moral character. Each rejection of Jesus plunges the unbeliever deeper into the night of darkness. There are only two lines of reaction to Jesus. The one is to accept his mercy. The other is to spurn his blood. The one is to respond to his love. The other is to withdraw through hate. The former is to love him. The latter is to hate him. The one is to trust him. The other is to reject him. The one is to become tender with him. The latter is to harden against him. The first is to become like him. The latter is to rebel against his righteousness. The former is to increase in Christ's likeness. The other is to increase in hardness. Isn't it the truth? That as a person rebels against Jesus, and especially if we share the gospel with them and kind of push the issue, you will quickly find where the sore is. You know, you've got a sore toe and it's aching a little, but if somebody even stomps on it a little bit, boy, it will light up, won't it? Well, the lost person that's angry against God, it won't take much to light that up. And you, you, will, you will touch their little red button pretty quick and pretty easy because they're mad and they're angry. And like this unrepentant thief, they are railing against God from a heart of bitter hatred. And it need not be because they can be saved. We talked a little about this Wednesday night, but sometimes you see people, though, that are so venomously angry, and just when you think there's no hope, it's like a switch flips, and they sometimes even break down in tears and say, I need Jesus, I know I do. And you know, folks, without preaching the next verse, that's probably what happened to the thief that did get saved, because the Bible does say that at first, he, he did the same thing that this thief did. Then something clicked. Jesus got through to him. So never give up on these folks. We also know that he was close to Christ without knowing Christ. We've touched on this a little. We're going to touch on it more. That's the bottom line, isn't it? Have you ever thought, this man is a few feet, I don't, you know, the crosses are not butted up against each other. Please, I, mean, I don't know how, but they're, they're talking distance. They're all talking back and forth here. So they're pretty close, physically close. He is a, within a few feet at most of Jesus Christ, atoning for the sins of the world right there close, and yet winds up eternally far away. John 3.3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You must be born again. I fear that there are a lot of people who go through their lives close to where Jesus is, but not in Christ. See, being close to Christ without being in Christ, being saved, will not do you a lick of good. Another couple of quotes that I've pulled out of my extensive little sermon file. <laughs> Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the poet, says, Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. I find that good poetry. I'm not even a connoisseur of poetry. I don't know if any of you all are or not, but isn't that the truth? It's like there is a funeral march playing in the life of every person, whether they know it or not, as we march steadily toward a grave. And there are people marching along saying, I'm right where I need to be. When I get a little closer to the grave, I'm going to grab hold of Jesus, but I'm never going to let Jesus be very, very far away. But I just don't want to do that right now. <laughs> Yesterday I was driving... Out, uh, I was going to try to go see uh, the, the Millers, Linda, uh, has her brother passed away. And, you know, Highway 67 and their road, I think it's 224, just run parallel for a long ways. But, oh, boy, pretty soon that one road veers off. And, folks, I want to say to you, there are folk out there that are saying, as long as I can see Jesus from where I'm at, I ought to be all right. 
but sooner or later, death veers off quick. And they might not have that second chance. And they're so very close. If you were to mail an envelope without a check in it to the power company, it would look good. If Jimmy Don picks up your mail and he doesn't pay careful attention, and I don't think he could possibly be even this good a mailman, but maybe you are, he wouldn't know if there's a check in the envelope. You got, your, you got an envelope and you got the little receipt that goes with the check. I doubt if even he would be able to say, no, nope, missing the check, missing the check. It looks good, doesn't it? And there may be people who are going along. It looks good. As far as I can tell, you can tell they're saved. They go through all the motions and they know all the words. And I don't know any different. And I'm the preacher. You think I'll be able to figure that one out? But I sure can. Only God can. But I guarantee you, if you get to the gates of heaven and there is not payment in full within the check of your outward appearance, and that payment is by Jesus Christ, you will not be accepted. It is not just enough to make it look good or even write Jesus on your license plate if he's not in your heart. Or have a big old bumper sticker that says, whoever died, you know, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. If you're not saved, you'll be on driving on, driving on. Folks, just know that the truth is, it is finished. When Jesus said, tetelestai, he meant it is finished, payment in full. But there are so many precious people who are so close to Christ, like the unrepentant thief, but they never, ever come to Christ. And I want to tell you, sometimes, not on Sunday morning, they're more bitter, they're more like that thief than you think. Because they get in their car, and they cuss the preacher, and half the people at church, but they're showing up because their wife made them, or their husband brought them, or whatever else it is. I don't know. I don't know why you people would laugh at that unless there's some truth to it. (laughs) Isn't it? Don't just be hanging around with Jesus. (laughs) Because if you get up to heaven and you try to tell God the Father, well, well, you won't get up to heaven if you're lost. That's bad theology. You can't tell Almighty God, well, I'm with Jesus unless Jesus says, that's right. He's with me. She's with me. Man, this fellow, there's more Bible there than we first saw, isn't there? Father, we thank you for your word. I pray you'll touch hearts and lives and minds this morning in whatever way you see fit. The altar's open, Lord, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing?